Next up, we have invited an innovative professional to speak to us about human-centered machine learning. Patrick Hall is Senior Director for Data Science Products at H2O AI, where he focuses mainly on model in interpretability and model management. Also an adjunct professor in the Department of Decision Sciences at George Washington University, my alma mater, Mr. Hall teaches graduate classes in data mining and machine learning. Please welcome Patrick Hall. OK. Everybody can hear me. My mic is on. Ooh. Stand away from that. All right. So uh, I'm, I'm Patrick. I work uh, with a, one of the more established Silicon Valley machine learning software companies. And in an effort to, to deal with things that our clients are asking for, and um, also, also I, the things that I'm showing you, I think, are the you know, one of the better ways to do business. So the, the solutions to, to some of the problems that the previous speakers have brought up, uh, I feel my job is, is to show you technically, you know, how some of these things could be done. And I feel like, you know, the one message I want to get across is, is that the tools exist today to solve many of these problems. And it's a question, I think, of, of making people aware. Now, I would say that a lot of the things I'm going to show you are um, more in an ideation stage, but, but some are very much solve technical problems. So the, the idea is to show this workflow that can be used to go towards what I would call a more human-centered machine learning. Okay, so this is, this is exactly how I think that you would, would do this. And, and it, it's all about lowering risk and increasing transparency and trust in machine learning. Now, there's a little asterisk at the bottom of the slide that says, this, this slide doesn't uh, touch on ETL or, or data preparation. And that's kind of like saying, you know, we're not going to talk about the bottom of the iceberg. But, uh, you know, I work in machine learning, and for whatever reason, people are really excited about machine learning. Machine learning is, uh, the way I like to describe it, it, it really is like the tippy top of the iceberg. You do all this important stuff with data that the previous speaker uh, addressed in a, in a great talk. Uh, and then, you know, there's this little tip of the iceberg that's machine learning, and then there's a whole other giant iceberg sitting on top of that for how you actually use the machine learning in the real world. And nobody ever talks about those things. They just talk about deep learning. So this is, this is uh, how I think that to be top of the iceberg could be done in a way that is more human-centered, lower risk, and, and actually more profitable. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through the way the talk works is I'm going to go through the workflow. And uh, it's going to be a little quick, and, and I'll try because I want to try to save some time for questions. And I'm just going to try to highlight some things about each step of this workflow. OK, so we're going to start with kind of uh, know thy data, right? And, and if you've been working with data for a long time, you'll know that this, this edict, uh, it, it still is important in the age of machine learning, right? Garbage in, garbage out still applies. And one of the main ways to know thy data is, is to visualize it. And I'm going to show two examples that I really like on the next slide. And for people who may be practicing this kind of stuff today, on the slides, uh, which I, I hope you'll have access to afterwards, and if not, just find me on LinkedIn or Twitter, and I can send them to you. I have some links for little Easter eggs that I've found. And uh, uh, H2O is my employer, but we also make completely free open source software. And this, this little Easter egg that I put in the slide is a uh, is a sampling routine that will take really big data sets and sample them down so that they work in kind of general visualization software. And it does it in a really kind of uh, technically correct way. So I'll leave that up there for, for people who might uh, be interested in trying this out. And then I've also put uh, references, either textbooks or journal papers, for people who want to try to find out more about how to actually do this. OK. 
So these are my, two of my favorite ways to know thy data. And uh, on the left, I would call that a network graph. And on the right, I would call that a projection. And so the network graph helps us understand the relationships between the columns in the data set. So each little node on that graph, each circle on the graph, is a variable in my data set. Uh, and I can start to see the relationships between the variables in my data set. And this is important because what my machine learning model does is learn relationships between variables in my data set. And so I want to know what my model should be learning before I start training it. So I'll have some idea if I should trust it or not. Uh, the projection helps us understand things about rows. So uh, the, the network graph is about columns. The projection graph is about, the projection graph is about rows. And uh, it can help us find structures in our data set, like clusters. So what you're seeing there, I'd say that counts as clusters. So you can find things like clusters and outliers. And you can tell if parts of your data are sparse, meaning there's not much data there. And it probably wouldn't be suited for machine learning. Uh, and and uh, you can find lots of interesting things about your, about your data by looking at it this way. And I think it's, it's really powerful to be able to see big data in, in just two dimensions on a sheet of paper or a computer screen. And that's why I like these techniques. OK. So another thing that's really important when you start to do machine learning is to establish benchmarks. OK? So how will you ever know if you've done better, and better could mean a lot of different things, if you don't know how you did to start with? So this is just a very basic kind of bookkeeping exercise of, you know, what was my original accuracy? Uh, you know, when I originally evaluated my model for disparate impact, which you should do, uh, what were those measurements? Uh, you know, did, was I keeping track of anything related to security or privacy? You want to write that down or store that before you move on so you know in the future if you did better or not. And then if you're in a compliance-oriented space, which I believe some of you are, uh, it's usually very, very important to show that you've considered reasonable alternatives by documenting them. OK, so once we've looked at our data, and we've, we've just done some basic information, we've recorded some basic information about it, uh, then we oftentimes go into this process of feature engineering. And feature engineering means taking the original columns that are in the data set and smushing them together or rearranging them or, or doing something to them to extract extra signal, extra information that the model can use to be more accurate or, or better in some other way. And you can do lots of really complicated things with feature engineering. And I'd say that's almost always a bad idea. Um, there, there are ways to do feature engineering that will make your machine learning model better that also don't make your process so complex that it cannot be explained. And I think that's the main thing that I'm hitting on in this slide is, you know, there's, there's this process that we often go through called feature engineering. And if I'm not careful, I can introduce undue complexity into my processes. And, and there's lots of ways not to do that, even automated ways. And we can do things like start thinking about privacy as we're doing our feature engineering. Start thinking about security as we're doing our feature engineering. We can also start thinking about uh, privacy and, and uh, disparate impact. How does my model affect different kinds of people, and is it affecting them differently than it's intended to? And these kinds of things can be done before you build your machine learning model, before you train your machine learning model. And that's what I'm suggesting here. They can also be done afterwards. And we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. And uh, I know the, the, the AI. Fairness 360 library was mentioned earlier, and I'll go ahead and call that out again. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting, important tool, and I think it's one of the, the tools that can be used to solve these problems. It's out there right now, open source, free, available for you to use. So I would definitely urge you to check that out in your machine learning projects. OK, this is one of my, this is one of my things that I, I had highlight that I, you know, highlighted to myself that I wanted to highlight to you. So there's this, this idea of when I build a machine learning model, you know, I, I don't want to use an old-fashioned statistical model because I'm not, you know, those aren't cool anymore or something that doesn't make any sense. But um, there is now the ability to train these complex 
nonlinear models that are directly interpretable. And I think that's a huge breakthrough. So that's one of the huge breakthroughs that I'd like to share with you. And what I've highlighted on the screen is a free and open source way for you to do this today. And these are both technologies I use all the time. And um, I can essentially build a monotonically constrained model. And what, what in the world does that mean? So that means that as an input goes up, say someone's credit score, then the output of the model can only go up or can only go down. And that just makes it a lot easier to explain it to people. So I can say to my boss, well, as their credit score went up, the amount of money that we wanted to lend to them, it was a little complicated, but it always went up. And I think just a sentence like that is really helpful in, in making the, the black box of machine learning more transparent to people, which is hugely important, and we'll get to that in just a second. OK, so for anybody who's been in the predictive modeling business for a long time, you'll know that there are many, many ways to check to make sure if your model is performing correctly. And we just need to keep doing that. that that's the basic point of this slide. Um, and, and there's lots of tools out there to do this. This is how we develop trust in models, OK? So uh, uh, I think both the previous speakers hit on trust. And trust is very important. We also want understanding, but those are, those are different things. They're, they're oblique concepts, meaning that they overlap, but they're also different. And we'll talk specifically about why they're different in just a minute. Okay, So explanations is how we enable understanding and the, and the uh, interpretable models. But if I go back, so, so model assessment and diagnostics, that's how I start developing trust in a model, and we want trust. Explanations, I would argue, is how we do understanding. Okay, So um, again, this is a place where the technology exists. Uh, the technology has been around for a couple years to the point where people are uh, starting to write sort of critical pieces about bad things that can happen with the technology. So uh, you know, I've highlighted some of my favorite open source tools that you could use to build explanations for models on the slide. Um, but, but there's actually many different ways to do this. So what, what even is an explanation in the context of machine learning? Right? And, and we often hear that machine learning is this black box, can't understand what the AI is doing. That's all untrue in my opinion. So if, if I was giving this talk two years ago or three years ago, I would have said machine learning is is a black box that's very difficult to crack. Well, in the past two to three years, I'd say it's been cracked wide open. And that's another message that I'd like to communicate to you, is that there now exists the ability for free to, to make these models more transparent. And that's something that you probably should do if you're using them. And the reason that you should do that, I would argue, is not only or necessarily about trust. It's about appeal. And we'll get to why we'll, we'll get to appeal in the process soon. But if I can't explain how a decision was made, you're in a very, very dangerous place where it, because it cannot be appealed. And any time that, that we're using automatic systems to, to make decisions about people, especially if they're based on machine learning, every decision needs to be explained so that it can be appealed. Okay? And, and so I would argue that explanations are much more about understanding leading to appeal than they are about trust. And I'll give you a specific example in just a minute. OK. And, and another thing I like to take the time to point out, and this is kind of for the practitioners in the room or people who might have practitioners working for them, is something called Shapley explanations. So, so this is probably the main technological breakthrough that allows me to stand up here on this stage and say to you, machine learning is no longer a black box. Okay? And it's a very old idea, like many things in machine learning, uh, that, that comes from the 1950s. It won the Nobel Prize in economics in 2012. And, and it was basically an idea from game theory that said, I have a bunch of people collaborating in a game, but I want to understand the impact of one person. Okay? And then you know, after 70 or so years, we were able to move that idea into the space of machine learning. And we say, I have all these variables in my model. I have all these variables in my big data data set. 
I want to understand the impact of just this one variable. What was the impact of this person's credit score on the amount that we decided to lend to them exactly? And so this allows us to do this. It's a very, um, very big breakthrough, very big breakthrough. And I'm just trying to um, make the point that it's been around for a long time and it's, it's a fairly trustworthy, well understood process that's won the Nobel Prize. So it's good enough for me. All right. So the reason that I'm harping on this idea about, you know, don't use explanations to establish trust is because I, I see a lot of people kind of arguing about this on the internet and talking about it at conferences. You know, they'll say, well, explanations have failed because they don't establish trust. And, and I would say, you know, that's kind of like saying um, the weatherman failed because, uh, you know, it, frogs didn't fall out of the sky or something. It's just, they're just not completely related topics. So what I have on this slide is a little bit technical, but, but basically I can explain to you why not to trust something. That's why, that's why we use explanations for understanding. I can really look into the mechanisms of this model and essentially it's um, overemphasizing someone's most recent repayment status in terms of whether it thinks they will default or not. It's overemphasizing that variable to the point where it's broken. The model itself is broken. So I can explain that to you in very technical and exact terms. That what that leads you to do is not trust the model, okay? So I can, explanations are, are somehow different than trust. They're not, they're not completely unrelated, but they're somehow different for trust, different from trust, and I would argue they're not the right tool to develop trust in models. So what is the right tool to develop trust in models? I, I would argue it's something that we call model debugging, which was brought up earlier. Uh, and this is related to, to well-established, hundreds of years old model validation techniques. Uh, but, but we're kind of able to just do things more now because computers are faster and, and people have thought about the problem longer. So we're able to think about how machine learning models can be hacked, which they can be hacked. Uh, we're able to think about uh, how to make models more accurate. We're able to think about isolating error mechanisms in models. We're able to think about testing machine learning models like their computer software, which they are. So uh, model debugging is something that I'm personally really excited about, and, and it's a fairly nascent uh, Field, but but uh, there's some good work that's been done already, and even some open source packages that I think are, are pretty uh, interesting and worth checking out. So so this is how we establish trust in the model by testing the model like computer software. Okay, how do I know my software is going to behave the way I expect it to behave out in the field? That's I would argue that's a better way to establish trust. Along with this idea of disparate impact assessment and remediation. So, you know, there's 21 definitions of fairness or, or something like this. Uh, I'll just, I just personally tend to talk about disparate impact because uh, that's a well-defined legal precedent that goes back decades. So disparate impact is, is different than disparate treatment. And I think maybe it's easier to explain disparate treatment first. So disparate treatment is when I have a machine learning model or other technology or other process that treats people differently based on some protected attribute. So uh, ethnicity, gender, you know, that's where I say, well, I'm not gonna market to women. Disparate impact is when my process treats different types of people differently by accident or unintentionally. And we can, the, the test for this the, the standard test for this is so easy that I would argue it could actually be done on, with paper and pencil. But how many machine learning models actually go through this kind of testing? Very, very few. And it, it's, it's just something that we should do. These technologies can discriminate against people and we need to test for that. And the standard test, while lacking in some areas, is well established in law and easy to do, okay? And there's three, three open source libraries right there that will help you do it. So we, we need to be aware that these models can discriminate against people 
And we need to test them for that. And this is another way to establish trust in our models. Okay? So we want our model to be right. And we want to understand the ways in which it can be hacked or manipulated so that we can prevent that. And we want to make sure that our models aren't discriminating against people. And I would say that those two things are the main things for establishing trust in a model. OK. Documentation. So these complex systems, just like you know, your Windows operating system, need to be documented. And there's a lot of reasons for that. A big reason is that you know, there's, there is turnover, right? Your hotshot data scientist go get a job somewhere else, and you have to hire new people, and they don't understand how the system works, OK? If the model's been properly documented, it's a way to make that knowledge transfer easier. Another issue here is these systems do behave incorrectly in the wild, and you need to know who to call. You need to know how to shut it down. You need to know, uh, you know how, how to potentially fix it. All of these things need to be documented with the system. And we've, we've touched on this too. And it's, you know, it's insane to give it one slide and a 30 second treatment, probably like everything in this deck. But uh, they, what I like to tell my students is, when you're sitting at your laptop typing your beautiful, perfect Python code, all you're doing is costing somebody money. The way you make money is by taking the beautiful, perfect Python code and putting it on a big, secure, fast server that probably doesn't run Python and, and have that be making decisions that make and save your company or your organization money or other value. Okay? And that process is called deployment. And that's part of that giant upside down iceberg that sits on the teeny top of the machine learning iceberg. And uh, there's some interesting open source solutions around this that you might want to check out. One more, because I wanted to save time for questions. So here's the appeal thing. Um, this, is, this is already a problem today. So there's a very famous mo machine learning model now called Compass that that they use to help make decisions about whether people should be paroled. Uh, and, and there's other similar models that are used to decide uh, whether people stay in jail before their trial. And the New York, the, the link that the reason today is pink is because there's a link uh, for, for a New York Times article where someone was not given parole multiple times because their information was entered correctly, incorrectly into this black box system. And because the manufacturer of the black box system uh, gave no explanations for how the system worked, they were unable to appeal, and they were held in prison uh, I, you know, for some amount of time, some ex unacceptable amount of time. So, so these things are real. And if you are making a system that makes decisions about humans, you need to keep a mechanism for appeal in the system. OK. And then, you know, we're all um, so fascinated by the accuracy of our algorithms. And uh, this last slide is just a plea to say, you know, maybe there are other improvements that we can consider in our systems. Um, fairness, interpretability, security, privacy. These are things that we could make better, too. It's not just about accuracy all the time. Okay. So um, like I said, hopefully the slides will be available. Um, the top link is some examples for me about how to do this stuff. The bottom link is just a list of all the software that I think you could use to do this. And that's just references. So let's stop and do questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hall. And are there any questions? Please come up to the microphone. Thank you. And if you want to be next, you can line up behind. Yes, hi. So my question is, um, you've seen a proliferation of tools like driverless AI, um, data robot, um, and tools basically that allow you to do automated um, data munging, data wrangling, um, and even to some degree uh, model interpretation. Mm -hmm. But I guess my question is, like, what is the next 
big opportunity within the machine learning space. So like you, you think about protocols like PMML, you think about um, you know automated insights uh, generation or insight generation. So mm -hmm. basically making data science a hostable service. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the opportunities that you're seeing on the, fr on the frontier that are cutting edge? And then what are some of the biggest challenges being faced by data scientists who are more model focused or predictive model focused? Okay. So yeah, thank you for bringing up driverless AI. My, my day job is, it's a piece of software that does automatic machine learning. My day job is to do the explanation, model debugging, and disparate impact analysis for driverless AI. Um, the, what I think is really, what, what I would like to see progress in is, um, you know, just asking in general, what do I feel like is a cutting edge important thing in the future? I'm really interested to see um, progress in deep learning for structured data, okay? Because right now, uh, all our best models for structured data are, are tree-based models. And so I'd really like to see progress on deep learning for structured data. Um, what, are some of the, what are some of the problems that I see day-to-day -day practitioners focused on? Uh, that documentation piece is a big problem for day-to-day -day practitioners because it's like they spend six months writing the model and now they have to spend six more months writing the report. And that, that really can be the time frames. And so we and other people are working on ways to automate that documentation process. Thanks for the question. And I forgot to mention to introduce yourself. So that was from Todd Edmonds, that question. Next question. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Andre Chanman, and I am um, an administrator with the district government. Um, as a practitioner who utilizes um, the information that comes out of the models to make decisions, um, you, may, you, you mentioned know your data, but, but for me, it is then taking the data into meaningful information, and then um, the fact that you, you can't really use the model to build trustworthiness. And so at the end of the day, what's in it for me for the employees or the residents of the locality mm -hmm. and building trustworthiness. So build, getting them to understand sort of crosswalks. And I sort of may have missed out on no, no, I, you were trying. So I wanted you to sort of link those two together for me as a practitioner to apply on the ground. I will try to. So I believe the first part of your question was, how do I? translate things that models learn into meaningful information for practitioners in a given domain. And that, in my opinion, is one of these things that, that machine learning has not and, and may not figure out for a long time. Because I think that, that, that is, you know, we're, we talk about automating these processes. That is something that I've personally struggled to automate. And I think it's very, very important for people like yourself or other domain experts to be able to, to take the results of these processes and explain them to the stakeholders. I don't, I, don't see, I don't see a computational solution to that problem yet. Now, what I hope I've provided, and if you go and get the slides after the talk, is sets of tools that will, that will make that process easier, okay? So if you wanted to use machine learning two or three years ago, you would have gotten a black box out, right? Now what I'm saying is, I and others and many, many others in the open source and commercial communities can provide you the tools to crack open that black box and, and allow you to see things that you wouldn't have seen before and you can say, oh, that's really interesting. That's what my people care about. That's what I want to talk to them about. Thank you for the question. And this will be the final question. I'm Prashanti. I'm a student at the University of Connecticut. Hi. So thank you very much for your um, presentation. It was very good. I, I also work at Bank of America in a marketing segment mm -hmm. division. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I thought was interesting was you mentioned uh, about the bias or potential to with the protected variables mm -hmm. in modeling. Mm -hmm. and, and I see that every day where we run models to understand the relationships with the protected variables but we're not really allowed to use it in mm -hmm. any of the marketing mm -hmm. um, analysis or the legal policy issues. Right. So where, where do you see the connection of how we can overcome that? OK. Uh, Two-part two answer. Two-part answer. So one is, I, 
I've come to, after a time, to agree with this idea of things like ethnicity and gender do not belong in marketing models or financial models. I mean, obviously, if you're doing some kind of medical model, then, then you may need to have that information in there. But the reason I feel so strongly about this is because the level of, of pigment in someone's skin is not causal to them not being able to pay their bills, okay? So it just doesn't make any sense to have it in the model, right? If you're interested in someone's employment record, someone's credit score, someone's length of credit, that's what goes in the model, okay? Not, not the color of their skin or their gender or their ethnicity or their marital status or their disability status. But as the, the previous speech, speaker mentioned, you do have to use that information, right? You have to retain that information so that you can test after the model is trained whether there is disparate impact across those, ac across those segments, okay? So, so the older school idea, which I agree with right now, is you don't put them in the model because they're, they're not causal to the things that we're trying to model, but you do test the impact of the model across those segments later after it's trained. Now, there's a newer, newer thought about this says, keep them in the model and, and treat them specially while the model's being trained, uh, and then, then try to work out the, the, if there is disparate impact and kind of reverse engineer it out of the model after it's trained. So that, that's like, uh, that would be the newer way to think about it. So those are my two answers. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.